I think this second, on the first part of the second page, uh, 180, top 185, I think it gives uh, all of the, his uh, digest of it, so that right side, um, so everything that they did. First, they identified a trend towards increasing, and you can say which one you think is wrong. Uh -huh. held, you know, a trend towards increasing integration of the economic and political. Monopolies emerge and intervene in the state while the state intervenes to safeguard and maintain economic processes. Uh, inter, uh, increasing interlocking of economy and polity ensures the subordination of local initiative to bureaucratic deliberation. So the spread of bureaucracy, fourth, extension of the division of labor, uh, fragments tasks, fifth, fragmentation of tasks and knowledge, the ex um, and the experience of class diminishes. So I don't know what you... Yeah, well, they're pretty broad, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how, I mean, how about the reading in the back there? Some of it is English. Is it all English? I think it is. No, there is all one English. thing there. Dubil, they have not translated Dubil yet, right? That would be good. Yeah, everything is, is translated except Dubil. Yeah. He is one, one very good fellow there. Yeah, so there you have at least some of the newer ones. To be would be one of them. Other must goes okay. Very good. Very good. What is it? Who's missing from this one? Because it's been a while since I read this. Because uh, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember the difference between this one and Connerton's Paul Connerton's uh, book in summary of the Frankfurt School. Uh, I think one or both of them were missing the contributions of Pollock and uh, Fromm yeah. and Lewenthal. And uh, this one does? Well, not just for a second, I'm not sure. I'm like it. Well, for reading, it should have more time in there. But yeah, it should be. Yeah. Well, wait, wait. well, that's fine. Thank you very much well, for well, giving yeah, that just, to us. Just yeah. for, you know, to have yeah. it as a reference. Mm -hmm. like, I read it and I thought it was good just to, to keep those... Mm. Um, you know, those, yeah. those five trends that they were identifying, uh, and then it gives some of the, the, the context versus uh, the traditional standpoint of Orthodox Marxism. Right. They also have Klaus offer there. That's good. He's a very radical fellow. So it's offer? Okay. Yeah. I mean, don't take that as a dogmatic statement now, you know. Because different people put different emphasis, of course, and accents, you know, on the whole thing. But, you know, it's wonderful. Thank you. Great. Okay. Very good. Now, is anybody else missing? Yes. Liz. She's on her way. She'll be out. She's out of class okay. right now. So she Do you know that this house has a name? It's called the House of Shalim. Shalom. Naturally. <laughs> <Shalane. laughs> <laughs> I guess some Jewish mysticism on that. Naturally. And if Shalane, then we have to say Gashom Shalane. Gashom. He didn't want to be called Gashom yeah, anymore. anymore. That was his Berlin name. Mm. Who is this person? Shalane. He is the. Um, he introduced people into the Kabbalah mm -hmm. and the Hasidim and was a good friend of Benjamin. Yeah. And I, I discovered recently, I discovered the mystery man. There was a mystery man in Munich who had something to do with Benjamin not going to Israel and not become a Zionist. And um, so Cholet was looking for him all the time. But I found him now. And he was a guy who was a survivor, unlike Benjamin who always fell into a, into a hole. But this guy, he, uh, as a Jew, this unbelievable, he worked with the German Secret Service and well, as a translator, he translated stories for him, for them, and wrote also international reports, so he, he survived. But he lived in uh, Munich at the same time when Benjamin was there, and so he must have had some influence on him, but he didn't teach him how to survive. That's, that's unfortunate. So Benjamin went under, the other one lived into the 80s, I think. Forget his name now. Okay, may we start then? Okay, it's... Uh, go one step after the other. Um, where are we? Which, which, which station do we have now? The, what is it? How many times? Uh, discourse number, number three. three, and now we have discourse number 
It will be really a discourse, so we don't have to have any lectures. Four, it is called Civilizing Achievements. Four, and then we will look at the others, what we had before. Okay, first of all, I have this Thomas More thing um, in, the, in Thomas More Parish. And Thomas More Utopia and American politics. So these two things we want to connect with each other. A utopia means always that you present what ought to be to what is the case in a society. So Thomas More lived in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And the utopia presents the tremendous critique of the decadent feudal system. And um, so the utopia, for instance, has things like private poverty of the means of production, things which only centuries later Marx said so. The private ownership of the means of production is the original sin, so to speak, and things like that are all there for it, which is amazing. Yeah. Okay. Then, I mean, he himself as a person, you know, is uh, maybe the Frankfurt School was not concerned with him because he's too religious or whatever. He wanted to become a monk once, but then he changed his mind, became a lawyer, and then he was the, what is this thing, he was Chancellor Henry VIII? Yeah. Huh? Chancellor for Henry VIII. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's another thing to it, Arch-Chancellor, or what is it? It's a judge first. Yeah, judge first, but there's another, it's something added to that title. So, And um, he, um, you know, was married, his wife died. He was married fast again afterwards, a very ugly woman who was older than he was and was a widow. And he had to marry her because he needed somebody for his household and for the children. It was a very rational type of decision. So, and this is the reason why the Roman Catholic Church uh, waited for 400 years in order to canonize him, because he married too fast. It's not entirely good, uh, completely clear how long he was supposed to wait, but maybe a year or whatever. But that he married after three months, that meant he was not a very virtuous person. And therefore, he could not be canonized. But the interesting thing is that he, that they did not wait 400 years because he killed people. Because as Arch Chancellor, I think that was the name of it, he um, put on trial heretics of the Tyndale tradition. So, 100 years before the Reformation, there was Hus, of course, in Bohemia, whom they burned in Constance, and then. There was this Tyndale uh, pastor in England who had the same ideas. And so the successors of them, uh, Thomas More sentenced, we do not know how many, but they were burned alive. And so one should think, you know, that the church would have hesitated, uh, you know, to make a guy saintly who uh, has killed so many people. Now it was that little sex thing which they think, and there we have this whole sickness of the West, which is repeated again and again. When the bishops went to Hitler, um, they came out and they praised him because he would purify the German soul. And what would he purify it from? From men and women bathing together, from nudist camps, which were socialistic, and uh, at the same time the concentration camps started. And the bishops said nothing about the concentration camps. But just about that sex thing, you know, porno and, and all that, Hitler would, would remove. And they were so happy about it that they forgot the aggressive side. So psychoanalytically, there is a strange treatment of the libidinous side of men and on the other side, the aggressive side, the killer instinct. As if the real bad side was the sex thing and not the, the other one, the killing thing. And it must have something to do with St. Paul or St. Augustine, some kind of Manichaeism sneaking in. So it would be a very interesting study. And it goes up to our Clinton, who is impeached for, this, for, the, uh, for his job. They were a sex job, a blow job. But he is not impeached for bombing Belgrade. The could that be the influence of Schopenhauer? No. It's much older. It's much older. So... For instance, in the church law, you know, early development of church law, they say killing is bad. But when the king says, you know, go out there and kill those Frenchmen, that's not killing. That's wrong. Oh, that's okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there is something very strange. And you look at it psychoanalytically, why people evaluate these two aspects of the it, or the will to life. 
I mean, the real discoverer is, is the Gautama, you know. But then Schopenhauer, you know, took it over in the modern West. Or so, but why, you know, this pressure on the sex thing and on the other side, the liberal attitude, you know, toward killing. Would you like to take that chair over there? I think I might just sit on the floor. You want to sit here and I'll take no, the chair because I like yeah. that. Wherever you feel most comfortable. Right. There's yeah, another chair. Like There's now. another chair. Okay, very good. So, um, so that to explore this really, you know, would be would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, so these are these Thomas Moore, Thomas Moore lectures. That's every Friday at um, seven o'clock in these new lecture halls. The Thomas Moore the new parish they built. Okay, you are invited. If you would like, and you don't have to come six times. Well, so you can just drop in and you know once. Uh, oh, first Friday. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, they said, you know, told the, they, they announced it to the parish and the diocese, and they said it would be a big thinking thing and a big intellectual thing. And so I don't know if anybody will come because the so Catholics are not uh, super intellectual nowadays. So, um, well, we'll see. Um, okay, then, uh, we said we wanted to have a test on the 11th of February to the 18th, and with these two models that you either can... Uh, answer, you know, some of these 25 questions or whatever they are, or to write a little essay on the man you have chosen. Or woman. Have, or the woman, yeah. Have you chosen somebody in the meantime? Yeah. How about us? Uh, you have how about us? You, you took how about us? Okay, very good. So you are the specialist of how about us. And maybe the next time or so you can tell us a little bit, you know, what you have read and if it's boring or if it's good or what's wrong with him or whatever, right? It's okay. slow, it's, it's slow getting started. Yeah. Yeah, what, what did you take? Which book? Uh, uh, since I have legitimation crisis and yeah. it's all quoted, I'll start with that. And I okay. found this short article okay, yeah. on um, uh, re- revitalizing historical yeah. materialism from 75. Yeah, you know, the book on that, yeah, reconstruction of historical material. Yeah. Okay, very good. I mean, you need only one book a month, right? And you can keep Habermas. You know, you can just concentrate on him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, who else should watch his form, right? Well, I'm also looking at Axel Hahnemann. Okay. So have you made up your mind? No. no. This from is easy to, to take. He's enjoyable. Yeah. Axel Hahnemann is... Not enjoyable. Uh, well, take something. Habermas take something say. enjoyable. And something which is meaningful, right? <coughs> I mean, just look at him what you, if you like him. We want to visit him, by the way, now in April when I take Mike up there and when you, we can all go there if you come along. Yeah. He's the director of the whole thing now. Uh, rising star, so to speak. Okay, so have you chosen something? Or? I'm doing Marcuse. Marcuse? Oh, very good. Have you chosen the book already? Or? I've started on One Dimensional Man. Yeah, okay. Very good, yeah. Okay, and you will take Habermas and Justin Rodriguez. Excuse me, Buck Morse. So you have all three together then? So you have this one here? Yeah. Okay. Origin of negative dialectics. Okay. So you take Adorno and who else is Benjamin? Uh, yeah, it's, it's Adorno and Benjamin. Yeah. Okay. For about those two? Yeah, it's about uh, Benjamin's influence on Adorno. Yeah. You know, I was eight years older and he was his teacher, really. Benjamin was his teacher. And then Adorno taught his stuff at the Frankfurt University without saying that it comes from Benjamin. Benjamin was very upset, terribly upset, and he never did it again, I think. <laughs> his whole life, uh, he just stole it from him. Okay, well, that's very good. So you have two together then. Have you thought about somebody? You know, I was wondering if I could get some feedback from you know, all of you about right. what you thought. I don't have very much experience with the Frankfurt right. School, exactly. so I mean, what generation would be, you know, good yeah. to start with? And yeah. I specifically, I'm really interested in politics, so right. I think any theorist that, do, that deals heavily with that would be. Yeah. Who is this guy yeah. down there? Yeah. I mean, they all have something to do with politics. Right. You know? right. I always say from because he seems to be the most accessible. Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah, it's, it's the healthy part of politics. You want to uh, play in. But Kellner, you know, is very politically very active. Mm-hmm. Kellner, he he was supposed to go with me to the Fifth International or whatever in Paris, and he was supposed to, to give a speech, and he didn't come. I went, but he didn't come because he wanted to fight against Bush. So. He was somehow active in the campaign or anti-campaign or something like that. 
So Ken, that would be uh, but uh, Douglas Kellner. Douglas Kellner, yes, his name. University of Texas. Uh, Marlington. Marlington. Yeah. Marlington. yeah. Um, he he wrote the the book on Marcuse about yeah. all Marcuse's work, and then the other one, what was critical theory, Marxism, and modernity, or something like that. Something like that. Who did the one on postmodernism? Uh, Kellner and somebody else. Yeah, yeah Kellner know. would be a good guy. Or, oh, um, you know, Marcuse, of course, was very much in politics, too. too. Now, should we each be taking a different theory? No, you don't have to take a different. No, it can be the same. Uh, take, take a different book, or you can take the same book. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, because From has written, what, about 25 books. Yeah. And then Adorno has done what? Yeah, but if, I mean, to start out in the Frankfurt School, Okay. Yeah, right. This, but uh, Fromm has written something on disobedience. Hmm. On disobedience. Uh, that would be good, yeah. you know, yeah. um, civil disobedience. Right. On disobedience. Yeah. The, the slim, the sunny black right. one yeah. for silver money. Yeah. Yeah. He also has founded a party, you know, and has, has written a party platform <coughs> in the 60s and 70s. So yeah. he became very uh, politically active. Fromm. Fromm would be a good, uh, he writes well, you know. Well, I say I always thought uh, Escape from Freedom is a good place yeah, to start. Yeah, that's another one, yeah. For from yeah. Same society. Yeah. The same society. But it, that, that's love, that even that one and Man for Himself are follow-ups to mm -hmm. Escape from Freedom. No. I don't think it's Henrik Grossman. Grossman? What did Grossman write? He didn't... He's a he didn't political work. economist. Yeah, yeah he didn't, wasn't yeah. too prolific. Him and, well, and Neumann... He and went to... That's the one who went to China, I think. He, he, he wrote the history. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He, uh, he studied China very thoroughly, and he worked years and years. He worked with the International Institute in New York, when they were in New York. And then he somewhat disappeared, and I don't know what became of him. His wife, too. They both were, and they got uh, uh, money from the Frankfurt School in order to do these studies. And uh, that means economic, cultural, religious, and so on. They, uh, they have this whole... Uh, you know, they used the Frankfurt School in order to study China. A lot of them just went into academics. A lot of them are on yeah. the periphery. Yeah. The, yeah. Martin, yeah. J. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Martin J. talks about what they say. They have a yeah. If they, they departed they peacefully or not, you know. That's all about here. How is your, you know, Freud, how is your Marx? You well grounded in that? I'm more grounded in Marx. I have a little bit of, expo little bit of exposure to Freud. Okay. Now, uh, Fong has written, written a book on Marx, a certain thing on Marx, you know. Bloch also has one on Marx, so Bloch is also a very good writer. Oh, what about uh, Offer? Yeah, Offer, I thought of him too, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the logic of collective action. That's yeah. That's really what Offer, yeah. Well, I mean, for the Frankfurt School, I mean, it's some of it, I mean, some of the most important foundation is in Marx and in Freud. Right, yeah. So, I mean, even beyond the chains of illusion, which is the sociology yeah. of Freud and the psychology of Marx, which is Eric Fromm, that would probably be a really good one as well. Yeah. And that's not a big volume either. So. As if you're well versed in, in Freud, then the, the book that wraps that up is The Greatness and the Limitations of Freud's mm -hmm. Thoughts, right. which is a short one, but, you know, my copy looks like someone just ducked you know, dunked it into a bucket of highlight. I, it's really good, um, but you know, I specialize in from, so that's all I would give for an answer. I, uh, for Marcuse, you know, one-dimensional man, reason and revolution. That's his his piece on Hegel. Yeah, yeah that was one of the uh, first things. Yeah. Want to see the fight between Marcuse and uh, from? That's uh, that journal. What is it? Uh, he was from was yeah. the, in charge of it, the editor. Yeah, and social, social forces. Yeah. yeah, was it social forces? No, it wasn't no. social forces. What was the name of the journal that Marcuse and Frum had that fight over Freud? Um, was that Descent. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's they have that in the library. Yeah. But you know, what in politics? Where? You know, what you write your master's on, or what are you going to write your master's on, or your dissertation? I wrote my master's on state crime and specifically 9-11, but okay. I'll, I'll probably stick with that same topic. I, I'm just very interested in politics and anarchism and Marxism. Uh, I would take much so, I mean, the uh, yeah. reason and revolution shows, you know, how the Hegelian right and Hegelian left developed. So the positivistic social sciences, and there is something on uh, the political and then fascism, too. 
you know, how that developed out of the uh, out of Hager. Mm -hmm. Did you look over Counter Revolution? Or I Revolution? haven't gotten a chance to look over that one. Which one? I'd I love Counter Revolution and Revolt. Yeah. 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 He was the man. He fought against Reagan. You know. Yeah. We were struggling with each other, shouting each other, yeah. unbelievable. And then Reagan won. Yeah. I mean, my good guys. Reagan went on. Yeah. yeah. And there's a good yeah. film if you go Google videos uh -huh. and put in Herbie's, right. uh, Herbert's Mark Hippopotamus. Yeah. Herbert's Hippopotamus. Yeah. Oh, it's a, a movie there about yeah. Herbert. Yeah. Yeah. It's about an hour, a little over an hour long. That's yeah. worth yeah. looking at too. And, and it's yeah. about his political engagement while he's in UC Berkeley or UC. Uh, yeah, was it USSD? USD? San Diego, yeah. San Diego. Still USD. over from California to Paris, even. It became international. In, in 68, May yeah, 68. 68, exactly, yeah. So, Marcuse yeah. was the activist. Okay. And you'll see, what is it, the American Legion talking about? When the yeah. Yeah. French brought out the riot police, Marcuse was the hero. Yeah. 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 Y
That means these people are not only dependent in terms of their tools and so on, but they are also humiliated. They are the nothingness of society, in whom everybody looks down. And, and so just study a truck driver or study a bus driver or whatever was it. Not only how much he makes, for instance, but also how he feels about himself. You know, where he stands and uh, the other people, how, his self-value, you know, all, all these issues they were in Marx. Marx went through the whole phenomenology of the spirit and uh, uh, read it in a different way, namely as the evolution of man who, um, by transforming his environment, is transforming himself step by step by step and so on. <laughs> so therefore, you know, when people say materialism or whatever, you know, it's, uh, Marxism is not a metaphysical materialism. Um, it's a dialectical materialism in that sense of the metabolism between man and nature and how man uh, creates himself in this interaction with nature and how he does this of course with tools and how these tools then do not only help him to dominate nature but other human beings too like Henry Ford putting all these people at the assembly line and giving them a dollar and let them let buy their own cars and thereby make profit on top of it and so on. So, um, therefore also the idea that the class system has something to do with scarcity that if the uh, scarcity could be removed then also the class society could be transformed. Okay, so uh, that, and, and then uh, one little other uh, trick there. Um, so what he calls, he has written these two books, Communicative Action, uh, two volumes. And um, so the uh, communicative action and communicative rationality is therefore the core of his whole work. But this communicative action consists of five different points. And if you have these five different points, then you know how Habermas approaches other authors before him and his own people in the critical theory themselves, how many writes about Benjamin and Adorno and so on and so on. He follows always the same five points and how they are interconnected with each other. And the first point is the subject, you know, who wrote this thing? It's Benjamin or it's Adorno and so on. Then number two, he produced what? A text. You can produce a text like I do it by talking or you can write it down. Um, and this text has a certain structure, a certain logic, a certain grammar, and so on. The past, the present tense, future tense, and so on, and so on. And then every text is related to a context, to a situation in which it is produced. And then every text uh, and every communicative action, so in order to get, so we can say communicative action takes place among the subjects who produce a text with a certain structure in a certain context and for a certain purpose. That means they are motivated by something. Now, you know, if you go, for instance, the old biblical criticism, you will see that some people study these sacred writings by saying, who wrote them? Matthew or Luke or whatever. And then they work on that for their whole life in order to find out if Matthew really did it. And other people make it contextual. And that is a very powerful thing. That means they look at the context of these texts. And today, in order to evolve Judaism, for instance, or evolve Christianity, or to reinterpret it, and so on, that plays an important role. For instance, by saying, in the book Leviticus, it says, you know, when a man lies with a man, and uh, if he does, he is death penalty, and so on. And then they come in with something contextual that is related to male temple prostitution and so on. That was really meant, and there is no temple prostitution anymore. Therefore, this law is not valid anymore. And therefore, we can take homosexuals into our community. And therefore, we can bless the homosexual community. There is a reformed rabbi up the trade road and so on, who, um, who has no difficulties to bless homosexual marriages between two Jews. But he has horrible difficulties to assist the marriage between a Jew and a Christian, or a Jew and a Muslim, and he refuses absolutely to participate in it. So, so or, you know, you take the story, the text of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then you say, you know, what does that really mean? Well, it's the story which backs up, you know, the sentence in Leviticus, but... Uh, what really happened, first of all, it doesn't say anything about homosexuality anywhere. You just, out of the behavior, 
you can conclude. But then they say, well, it was not really sex, but it was, um, it was gang rape. They wanted to gang rape them. So it's a law against gang rape, but it is not a law against uh, homosexuality. Or in this cultural context, you know, between the uh, Euphrates civil civilization and the Nile civilization, people did not have yet this experience, you know, of male or female friendships and sexual relations and so on. So therefore, as the situation changes and we go through sexual enlightenment and so on, then suddenly people make new experiences, new uh, gender experiences, and uh, so therefore one has to change those texts. Now, of course, though, though they would, uh, they take one of those five things which Habermas has put together. One takes, you know, the authors, one takes the text in itself and makes the continued text analysis and so on, and the other one emphasizes the, uh, uh, the uh, environment in which it takes place, the situation and so on, and therefore throws light of all of it with all the consequences of relativism, for instance, you know, I mean, what happens to the absolute character of morality, um, you know, when it changes with the situations and so on. And so uh, the relativism would be one charge which then the orthodox rabbis throw at the reformed ones and so they get in trouble with each other, which puts, you know, these communities into, gets them into trouble, of course. So. Or others start with, uh, um, with motivation, you know. They ask why, why was that book really written, Genesis, you know, or the first book of uh, the Gospel of John or whatever. And then they say, well, it was not the motif, motivation to write history, but, you know, that's important. So they did it in order to announce something, you know, to, a proclamation of some uh, redemption or whatever. That was their purpose. Therefore, they never wrote anything about the sex life of Jesus. It was not interesting for them. Maybe he was married, uh, you know, maybe he was a widow, maybe he was divorced. Everything is possible. But it's not in the text because these people were not motivated to give us a clear biography of Jesus. And so many of these people would say such a biography cannot be written, a biography of Mohammed, a biography of Moses, and so on, because the way how these writers, these authors were motivated was not to write history, um, not to make myth neither, but it was, you know, to, they had an experience, an overwhelming experience, and they then used the forms which were present in the cultures in which they moved, and so then they tried to express this impression which overwhelmed them and wanted to share that with other people and convert them. That was their purpose, so that they would have the same redemptive experience which they have had. And so that, that gives a perspective. So you could say that each of these five points uh, is some kind of perspectivism. You then see certain things very strongly and you forget the others, you know. It's not interesting if Matthew or whatever did this. The main thing is that they wanted to proclaim the good news or whatever and whoever did this doesn't matter so much. And for others, the authors are tremendously important. So uh, that means when you see how Habermas works is uh, that he looks at Torquem or anyone else, or, um, you know, uh, Marx or Freud or whatever, and says, you know, who, who was he, with whom did he talk, and uh, what did he say with these people, you know, and uh, it's a very dialogical type of, uh, of an approach, you know, and very lively, I mean, his writings are beautiful, you know. So um, I'm just writing the invitation there of, uh, uh, to for Dubrovnik, you know, and the uh, I looked again at the speech which he gave when he received the Peace Prize, which was a few months after September 11th, you know, <coughs> where he looks at the non-believer and the believer. So he has two persons practically who encounter each other, you know, and uh, one is uh, happy with the secularization, the other one is unhappy with the secularization. Then he finds out that both of them are wrong because we are now in, in a post-secular type of a society, and therefore, uh, to that CO, CO game thing there, you know, that only one can win, uh, and that the other one has to pay the price, that is not so anymore. 
um, the religious people have not lost totally in that secularization process. Obviously, some of it is left of them. And from there, he argued that they should have a right to enter public discourse and enter the public sphere with their language, and they have to translate what they have to say. These are all language categories, but they are tremendously fruitful um, in order to... Uh, he starts out, you know, with a stem cell problem, with the believers and non-believers and so on, and then he comes with um, uh, Atta, Muhammad Atta, you know, and sees the believer who attack non-believers, he knows exactly, he doesn't, they don't attack Catholics or whatever, or Protestants or Anglicans, otherwise they would have bombed the cathedral there, but it is the non-believers whom they, whom they attack, you know, and, and the symbols of this uh, infidel type of capitalism and secular type of, of, of a system and so on. So, so therefore, to, with these five categories, or let's call them categories, these five categories, either that you take one of them and you could analyze, you know, a man just from this one thing, with whom did he talk and whatever, you can analyze him by saying what was the purpose of that discourse, what did they really want to achieve, you know. And you can start out with the environment to which they reacted, and uh, there was a revolutionary period, a counter-revolutionary period, and, and so on. So it's a very fertile thing. I, I always have the feeling of a certain scholasticism, you know, and that it puts a certain restraints on, on people. So I've never imitated that, but I know some people, you know, like... Uh, Arendt and Poikert and so on who, who uh, work with that you know and with this type of scholasticism and they are not so lively as Habermas is you know it's his own invention and therefore he does it very concretely and in a very fascinating way uh, and even when you are with him you know and you talk with him you see how, how much that opens up horizons all the time and uh, the generative uh, power of language you know one says something and the other one says something and how, how this is a mutual recreation or creation is going on between two people. So, <coughs> therefore, you know, that is his accomplishment. Um, if one can imitate this or whatever, you know, if it can be learned, this question, if it can be taken by the next generation and so on. But um, Arends and Navamas, they are in, you know, in relationship to each other. Arends is a believer, Navamas is a non-believer. And so... I talk about this, uh, you know, all the time, and, and uh, it's a very interesting type of, of a discourse. So, and, and uh, so, the community of action, the main, the most uh, um, uh, extreme or the peak of this community of action is discourse. In discourse, where two people are married, what is happening between them is this communicative action, and then when there is a crisis in this, then in discourse they reflect on this communicative action and say, honey, you know, we are not so close anymore as we were, or honey, we have come too close with each other, and both are death zones of interaction, because there must always be difference, but there must also be identity, there must always be closeness, but there also must be distance. And so one could say, honey, you know, we have come too close and, and we are too, hanging too much together. Maybe we should take separate vacations or whatever, you know. Or you are traveling all the time. We have become too distant from each other and maybe we should go over the weekend without the children and should find our way together again and, and so on. So the whole dialectic of love, which Hegel called the dialectics of love, um, can be reflected on and as they have a discourse with each other they can see if they have become too different or if they have become too identical and then can uh, you know become practical theory theory praxis um, movement so and then say let's do something about this you know in order to come closer again or also to have more distance you know because there's a sim symbiosis going on and we become one plant really or one cactus or whatever it's a, you know, that we also, the myth for instance when the myth says they become one flesh the myth is only one side the identity the myth neglects completely the difference that they grow in a different uh, uh, speed and uh, that one grows the other one doesn't grow at all uh, and that out of this of course a lot of problems can arise um, 
the uh, you know the older model you have it uh, one flesh or one spirit or whatever it's just one side of the relationship and it is the other side which produces the problems now that um, she you know is a waitress in order to get him through law school and he gets differentiated in law school in these three years and she gets stagnating stagnates and um, then suddenly after she has got him through law school we cannot talk with each other anymore that's with my good friend Ken who helps me since many years that's exactly what, what happened to some extent you know <coughs> so you quote Hegel in a, in a yeah. passage and he says uh, something about the definition of love is being able to see oneself in the other. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, so I mean, that means you know, all this uh, this dialectic movement of going out of oneself to the other, and to the other allows us to return to ourselves. Uh, the the linguistic uh, sometimes it looks as if. Uh, Habermas had invented a new method and had left uh, somehow dialectics behind which is not true you can suddenly see when he talks about September 11th you know there suddenly comes this and uh, because of the tremendous development of the productive forces of science and technology there is suddenly a Marxist statement there in the middle of his otherwise linguistic analysis so um, I think he remains dialectical and it would be interesting to ask if these five categories do not have a dialectical relationship with each other, you know. So that means that one subject, you know, that they are in a continual exchange process with each other, that they are different but become one in, in their speech, you know. They may forget their whole environment. If people have a wonderful discourse with each other, they may forget everything around them, you know, and may become one in this, in this exchange process of... So he talks about these five things, but you know the subjects are the dialectic relationship, but also the subjects and their environment, their situation, you know the text and the and the context. Uh, and so on. So he has a book for his text and context, which is uh, obviously you know dialectical formulation. So um, so it is it is rather uh, he gave him concept of supersession. In his uh, linguistic theory, he supersedes the dialecticians before. So, but he rescues the dialectics in his uh, in his five points there. But it can be a, when I look at arms and so on, they forget about this. You know, <coughs> they think that uh, that um, Hegel's uh, you know idea of the notion that means the universe and the particular and the singular that this has all been deconstructed and is, uh, uh, you know, forgotten, and so, which is not true. What they have done is that was a theological concept and they produce, now produce as a secular type of a concept. It has nothing to do with the Trinity anymore or whatever, but it's still, when they talk about the notion of the nature or whatever, it's still a very dialectical, uh, for the, or when they talk about the family. So um, they have a book, uh, you know, Hakama, um, Hakama Marcuse and Form wrote a book about the family. And there you see, you know, there are three levels. There's culture, there is society, and then there is the family and the individuals. The last one is the singular, society is the particular, and the culture is universal. And you can, uh, you know, each of them can become a mediating factor. So that means the particular, name of society, mediates now the individual and the family with the culture, or the culture with the family and the individual. Uh, and then you can put, you know, the family into the middle and make that the mediator, mediating uh, term there between them. And this is all, uh, is all Hegelian logic, you know. And not only that, they would uh, read Kafka and would see, you know, that suddenly categories of nothing, being, and becoming, and so on, that they are all there in Kafka, or in, 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 and so on, and so on. So, um, they definitely, Adorno and so on, remains a dialectician, but also when we make that linguistic turn and then have these five categories, I think they, they remain uh, dialectical. So now with this, what I just mentioned, this uh, going out thing there. So the notion means the universal particularizes itself and then singularizes itself. That means it returns into its own singularity. The Neoplatonists uh, used that notion that was the highest accomplishment of Greek philosophy. And the Greek uh, church fathers put that together with the New Testament. Of course there is no trinity in the New Testament. 
there is the Father, of course, and there is the Son, and, and to them there is the Holy Spirit, which is promised after the Son is dead, and so on. So, but um, there was never a doctrine, if you would have asked Jesus or Mary or Peter or whatever, uh, tell me about the Trinity, you know, one nature and three persons, and, uh, you know, Jesus, how are you now? How is your human nature doing? How is your divine nature doing? He wouldn't have known what the hell they are talking about. I mean, not even the Greek Jews, you know, who were around. Jesus was not a Greek Jew, but not even them. But the Greek uh, uh, fathers, church fathers, did this unbelievable movement, you know, which is decisive up to Regensburg. You know, the, the, the Cardinal, I think the Pope's talk in Regensburg, you know. Um, the, uh, they bound together the highest accomplishment of Greek philosophy, the dialectical notion, with these writings there in, in the New Testament. It was particularly with the help of Plotin or the Neoplatonists, and uh, Augustine was a Neoplatonist, and, and still, you know, even in the Latin, on the Latin side. So, um, and, and this produced then these councils and, and Nicaea and Chalcedon and so on. And then there is state power too, because the state now was interested, you know, that uh, there's the Alexandria and, uh, and uh, the other cities. So one said Jesus is a man, the other one said Jesus is a god, and so on. And then they tore each other apart and sent each other into exile and so on. And so the emperors could not endure that. That was not good for the empire. So they simply forced the bishops together and you develop now a formula, you know. So in one city, Caesarea, they say he's a man in Alexandria, and you get that together. And so they, they got this formula together on the basis of Greek philosophy. Now, if Greek philosophy gets lost, you know, for the Muslims, Aristotle gets lost, and the Christians, Aristotle gets lost, or whatever, then it's all hanging in the air. And the interesting thing is that in Regensburg, you know, where you got to Pope got in trouble with the Muslims and so on, um, but because the whole damn thing was misunderstood, what he said was practically the dehellenization of Christianity makes it into a tiny little story. It will not be Christianity any longer. And so, uh, therefore, he turns against the dehellenization of the Enlightenment, dehellenization of the Reformation, dehellenization of uh, intercultural multiculturalism. You know. So people talk about here again about, you know, we will not be a one racial or not one race will any dominate anymore. We will be a plural racial and a plural cultural and so that is this uh, uh, plural culturalism, multiculturalism. And what the Pope has against that is that Christianity may be connected with another culture as it was connected with the Greek culture. And that does not work. It will never put, go together with the Chinese culture as it went with the Greek culture. And what that really means is this notion, this dialectical notion there, this going out of oneself, alienating oneself from oneself, and conquering this alienation and reconciling oneself with oneself. And in terms of poetical things, we can say narcissism. And this atomistic liberalism, you know, which the neoliberalism is here, that is uh, um, an abstract liberalism, I call that all the time, because these atoms have a hard time to get out of themselves to otherness, really. They say, how are you? I'm fine, and so on. But there is no real moving over to the other and no return. And so Narcissus, we can call that liberalism, narcissistic. You see that even tonight, you know, there are in the Senate and on the Republican side, there are people, while the whole capitalistic thing, you know, is wiped out underneath them, they go on with this atomistic type of a thing, one has to leave it to the individual businessman, unto the free market, and so on. And, and so they, they are against both. They are against Bush and they are against Obama when they vote tonight. They will vote against the stimulus package, you know. In spite of the concession of $200 million for birth control and so on, they cut that even and they may make other concessions and so on. But it's a mindset, you know, it's a philosophy. And the philosophy is narcissistic. And Narcissus has that problem that he sees always himself. When he looks in the water, he sees only his own image. He cannot break through to otherness. The lack of otherness is his problem. And you have this Don Juan on the other side. He has the opposite problem. He can particularize himself. He can go outside. And he has all the girlfriends in Spain and Italy and Germany and so on. But he cannot return to himself. So 
the notion contains both elements, the alienation and the reconciliation, both of them, and so uh, that would be, you know, a normal human being would be one which is neither, who is neither narcissistic nor is a Don Juan type, both are hellish. It's hellish when you cannot break out of yourself. And it's hellish when you are breaking out of yourself and get lost outside. And that's why Mozart puts him into, in, you know, Don Juan into hell where he always has been already. So, but our, you know, experience um, is rather that of the narcissistic type bourgeois society, but uses millions and millions of these narcissistic characters who then have great problems in, in marriage and, and neighborhood and, and so on and so on. And on the other hand, you know, you could say the Soviet Union, they did go outside, they did have solidarity. But when the East Germans came to West Germany, what they always complained about was there was no friendship in West Germany. And then there was no longing for a new society in West Germany. They always wanted the old stuff. And when sociologists then uh, went over and stole all the chairs in East Germany, you know, and taught these students, the students always asked, but can't you tell us how we, how we can go to otherness, how we can get out, you know, and have a new type of a society? And then the teacher said, hell, stop with that future dreaming all the time. Just, you know, deal with what is the case, you know. Quantify these things and put statistics on them. Just be happy with what is. You don't get anything else than what is. And so so um, as you, see, it, it, you could say, you know, that the notion is broken in, in the West and the East in, in, a, in an opposite way. Uh, in one case, people are too narcissistic and have no otherness. And the other side, they want to have this otherness all the time, but, you know, the, uh, the individuality may be lost or neglected or whatever, so... How does somebody, want, how does one return to that reconciliation state, that, or, you know, make yeah. it to that point? Well, I mean, in marriage, you know, would be a good example. A love affair would be the most concrete things, you know, to what extent people really go out to themselves. I think homosexuality, you know, may have something to do with that one cannot, in, in this particular example, you know, break out into, into otherness. Uh, and then, of course, one can also not return. One stays always with the same gender. So, it, it, you know, otherness always means something different in different situations. So, but in terms of homosexuality, it would be, you know, that one cannot really uh, reach out to, to this other... Um, and, uh, I mean, I have, this, I have a son who is a homosexual, so I had years and years, you know, to, um, to then we kept him in the family and we love him and, uh, you know, he did wonderful things for the family and so on. But um, there is a strange thing about otherness, uh, let's see, in the form of the mother, for instance. So when he comes on Christmas, he wants to take the picture of his mother down, always. Of course, he has a, a cover-up. He says, I want to put, you know, wreath on this, so therefore it has to disappear or whatever. Or when my wife was dying, he was sitting in the basement and was drumming, you know, like, and had a little drum, and, and he played, and it, uh, he knew it was disturbing or what for his mother, you know, laying over there and, and suffering and so on. But he forgot it always again, you know, and then when I said to him, you know, stop it, your mother wants to sleep, he would do that right away, you know, so... so and he has friends who have uh, five children, two men in Los Angeles, five children. And the women should not come in. Now, they do need them at the fringe, so because they have their own children. So they fertilize uh, eggs of women, and the women carry them. They never see those women. They just get the babies. And, but then in order to take the babies, they also hire a maid. Uh, so they can never keep it out completely, but they do their best, you know not to be in touch with this otherness, but to stay in terms of their sameness. That means the same gender. And so, so, but there are, you know, there are many other examples where otherness is not, not reached. So um, they have this formulation of the longing for the totally other, the entirely other, uh, which comes from Otto, you know, has this the sacred uh, thing there, the book about the holy... Uh, so it's therefore they would say that they are also religious, unmusical, or whatever. 
where they cannot elevate themselves to the otherness of this world of appearance or this finite world and so on. They can just stick with the finite world. And the dialectics between God and the world and so on, it just doesn't move with them. So, so there are many ways how otherness is excluded and how people can remain narcissistic. I would say it is, the, you know, that is the one-sidedness which characterizes civil society to a large extent. And against that, then, you have the protests, you know, of course, the socialists who emphasize the socius, you know, which is exactly the other in all its forms, you know. And, uh, and, and want to overcome that civil society. And then comes the fascist movement in terms of national socialism, you know, who then want to satisfy that longing for solidarity and, and so on, and at the same time rescue capitalism. So it is this unholy trinity, you know, civil society has the problem, socialism is the answer, and civil society uses fascism in order to cancel that socialism again. So therefore you have the, the Arena Party in El Salvador, you have a fascist sitting everywhere, and, and uh, we pay for them, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so and Hitler was this guy I just saw him yesterday in a movie where he goes to the Krupp family you know uh, visits Krupp's and Bertha Krupp did not come did not receive him and so he was angry he marched through the factory halls you know and was a uh, thunderstorm was going on and so, so then uh, Krupp the old Krupp you know uh, took his sister his sister had to come with him but Hitler noticed it was the sister it was not the wife he was not recognized adequately and so on but then, two years later, you know, the Krupp family was all for Hitler. And then Bertha was there and jubilated when Hitler came and, and so on and so on. So, so this is, uh, you know, they, they used him. They tried to use him uh, in order to come with the communists and the socialists. And uh, I don't know if they planned, you know, to go into the whole Soviet Union or whatever. So, but then Hitler broke out, you know. He, he was not a simple guy that they thought he was, you know, a little trauma or whatever, a little private soldier or whatever. Corporal. He was much more corporal, he was much more than they ever fought for and, and so um, and so you know, that that is and we are in this thing too. I mean we have this little essay here, you know, where we will have to decide this, what if we go the Peron way or the, the Chavez way, uh, you know, there is a, a possibility of a fascist solution to all of this in terms of corporatism with the exclusion of the 180 million workers or there is a socialistic um, possibility you know the, uh, the Chavez way so where the masses would participate in in what happens with their surplus value in whatever form you know whatever form that would take so but the notion the dialectical notion is uh, is not abandoned by the Frankfurt School that would be the wrong wrong thing it is just not a theological concept anymore. It is now a secular one, right? a sociological one, and so on. But it is always this type of a rhythm, you know, to also when the worker, they look at the worker, that the worker alienates himself by building a car. That is not really condemned. What is condemned is that he cannot return to himself, or that he returns to himself only partially, namely in form of his wage, but not in the form of recognition. You are the real producers of wealth. But that the damned capitalist with his billions says, I am the producer. We call the capitalist the producer in spite of the fact that the worker is the producer. And even the worker believes that, you know, that uh, forgets about it. He's unaware that he is the real producer of all the wealth. Thank God Henry Ford gave me a job. Yeah, <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. And I mean, there is some truth. He, he does get a job, you know, but uh, he gets on, on a very perverse type of a situation because why can he give him a job? Because he has capital. And that capital is the dead labor of yesterday, of the workers of yesterday. So that means he turns the workers against the workers as he turns nature against nature. In the policeman, we turn the aggression of the policeman against the aggression of the criminal. We turn the criminal in the policeman against the criminal outside. And sometimes it doesn't work. The criminality in the policeman breaks through. And then we have two criminals. Namely, where a policeman beats somebody to death there who doesn't even have, have any weapons or whatever. So, you know, where they become violent, as we say. So you have a little implication that every policeman is sort of a little, a little fascist. 
Yeah, a uh, fascist in miniature that's used by bourgeois right. society against yeah. the workers. Okay. Yeah, or you know, more psychoanalytically, that if we have that id, and, and uh, this, uh, we we turn the aggressive component of the id in the policeman against the aggressive component of the of the of the murderer outside, you know. And it's a very precarious balance on which the whole civilization rests. And therefore it can so easily, like Guantanamo Bay and whatever, it can collapse, you know. Um, or this in, 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 in uh, you know, in Iraq, uh, what, what happened there in, in the prisons and so on. <laughs> it takes almost nothing, you know. And uh, when the civilization is halfway stable, you know, then people forget about what is underneath. And Freud, when Freud says, people always knew about spirituality, you know, but they didn't know about the instinctual life uh, underneath, which is not entirely true, of course. Aristotle knew about the instincts, and, and so did Schopenhauer, and, and so on, of course. So it's, so it's an exaggeration, but it's a, it's a shift, you know, for attention. That means I'm paying attention now to the basement there, in, in there, in the basement of the individual, like Marx went into the basement of society, uh, and, and so where people, you know, see this idealism or whatever, he says, you know, it's a matter of eating, you have to eat first. Before you eat, you cannot have a democracy or whatever, you know. The other one says, you know, the same thing about sex or aggressions or whatever. So, unfortunately, we have that, fortunately, whatever, this basement. And the question of uh, aching out, you know, a little bit of civilization, Freud would say, look, I'm not very uh, optimistic, but, you know, if you know about the dangerous things in your society, and you know about the dangerous things which are in you, yourself, in your will to life, you know, then maybe you can, uh, you know, build a little civilized island, you know, where you can have a good marriage, a good family, or a good circle of friends, or neighborhood, or city, or, or state, or whatever, you know. Definitely, I mean, Obama, the way he goes, you know, gives the signal, he talked to the Arabic radio station uh, two or three days ago, and it had very good reactions, you know, all around the Arabic world, so he, uh, you know, there is this possibility of, of creating civilization. We can do that, but so easily, you know, it is broken through again into utter barbarism. And the Gaza thing, you know, a few weeks ago, that is the breakthrough of absolute barbarism. Yeah. Again. Or Guantanamo Bay, and so, you know, the message, we will close this now, it has right away resonances in all human beings who have an interest to keep civilization going. But it's a very, very dangerous thing, you know. It's not only fascist, it's, you know, we have done Stalin too, so it can happen under any kind of a system. <laughs> okay, but um, anything else about this book? So that's what it's about, right? Habermas, the human potential of, um, of language and memory, and that means also anticipation. And then there are these four, five categories um, by which we can understand communicative action, and communicative action climaxes in discourse, and we can define discourse as future-oriented remembrance of human suffering with the practical intent to diminish the suffering. And so in this case, the critical theory is an ongoing type of a discourse. Since 1914, since the happy island of happiness, which uh, uh, Pollock and uh, Suze and, and Horkheimer founded, from that time on, this discourse has been initiated. And it's uh, something very similar, like religious things, like Jesus and his friends, and uh, Horkheimer used that. He said, you know, the same thing happens to us, what uh, happened to Jesus, they misunderstand us everywhere. You know, even the youth movement itself understands, uh, misunderstands what we, what, we have to, what we want to do. And so I think what we have to do is to see to uh, rescue as much as possible the critical theory of, of misunderstandings, because it is very understandable, you know, that different cultures and so on, these texts, these texts now in different contexts that are understood in a different way, and some of these ways may be legitimate and others may not be uh, legitimate, and how do we know this? I think uh, the core of the whole thing are really the, the genius Adorno, and in combination with Horkheimer, I think that this constitutes the the um, you know the core of that what's called critical theory and the question is how far the other so Marcuse dedicates his stuff to Horkheimer and therefore says yes that's where I'm coming from with that form we have some difficulties about money and, and ego 
psychology and so on. But I think fundamentally they never attacked each other. I think it was always clear that Fromm was part of them and that Horkheimer regretted most deeply of all those who left. Uh, Fromm's leaving was the most painful one. And I think it had something to do with Fromm's being rooted in the, in the Torah and the Talmud and uh, that he had a radical interpretation of Judaism and so on, which they liked very much. So that was a painful thing when he, when he left. Uh, and, but there was no hostility later on. And Adorno said some nasty things sometimes. But yeah, neither uh, Adorno and Fromm never liked each other. Right, yeah. <coughs> okay, so could I um, ask a quick question? Yeah. It's kind of far this, back, yeah. Uh, yeah. but about the uh, inability of Christianity to, to go out to another culture yeah. that you were talking about. Okay. Uh, are you, uh, do you mean that um, uh, it's sort of like the original sin of Christianity, that it's... Um, whatever internal coordinates were established by a particular culture and it doesn't want to admit that it's culturally constituted so it can't reach out to other cultures and say oh well we can accept this culture no. because we accepted Hellenistic culture. But let's see you know where they really tried so the Jesuits went to China as you know you know and tried to introduce Christianity into China and they were extremely open to assimilate, you know, so they wanted to call Yahweh Dao, you know, or they wanted to de latinize you know, why should we call him Deus, you know, or Theos, like Greek, and so on, let's call him Dao. And then there was this struggle, you know, with the Franciscans, and the Franciscans went to, the, to Rome and said, you know, they betray Christianity, and so on. They wanted to take, they wanted to be dressed like priests, Taoist priests were dressed, and so on. They wanted to learn, you know, morality instead of natural law. They wanted to take Confucius and, and, and so on. So that was the most extreme type of a thing. And it would be interesting to say what would have happened if the Jesuits had won, you know. Um, you know what would have, who knows. But, you know, maybe today only 1% of the Chinese are Christian, you know. So you could say that the East Asian missionary activities was a total failure. Yeah. But the, um, the problem is, is somewhat a different one. Uh, the Pope brings together two texts. One is the Genesis text, and the other one is the first chapter of John. So in the one case, God creates, and he creates man in his image. And, um, so, and in the other one, uh, it, God creates something in himself, which is the Logos. And the Logos is God, it's himself. And he is, uh, through the Logos, everything is created in this world. And then the Logos becomes flesh, which is the hardest thing. We, the Neoplatonists didn't have that, where, where this Logos, this particular, becomes connected with this singular uh, carpenter from, from, uh, you know, from the Holy Land or whatever. And so this is the hardest point in, in Christianity. The Neoplatonists had the Trinity, but that one person of that Trinity is uh, grasps somehow or adopts or so, this one singular person, and that all the others can be grasped the same way who follow him, you know. And that you have this in the mystics, in Eckhart and Jakob Böhme and so on. So um, that God generates the Logos in himself, but he generates the Logos in every person who is open for this, for this process. So that means who is, uh, uh, lets things go, uh, like being and having, then from there it comes through, you know. So if you change from a having person and you become to a being person, then the Christian version is that the Logos is born in you as it was born in Jesus of Nazareth. Because only slowly, you know, this Christology is developed and it's far from being completed, you know. These Greek formulas are not the end there. There is an adoption type of a, of a Christology, which uh, Mohammed and so on took over, where, you, um, where Jesus sits in the water there and the Holy Spirit comes and this is my beloved son or whatever, or on Mount Tabor and then on the, um, you know, the resurrection. Where it's, where it's, that's when he becomes the son and sits on the right side of the Father, which the psalm says. And then suddenly it moves before his birth and there is a pre-existence he is already with the Logos from all eternity, and then is born, and, and so on, so that he was already there before he was there, and so on. So only slowly this is all evolving, and then comes this 
influence there with this this Greek notion there, uh, where where they try you know to use that dialectical notion in order to explain what the real relationship between that father and that Jesus was. Um, our father, you are in heaven, and so on. Every Jew can pray that. Every Muslim can pray that. It's totally monotheistic. It is not, you know, uh, Holy Jesus or whatever. It is Holy Father. It's, it's clear monotheism. And so, and there is this Jesus who is a subject, and then Jesus becomes an object of worship. That is the real turn which the Frankfurt School rejects. You know, they made a religion out of him. So Horkheimer, you know, loves this Jesus of Nazareth, who loves, who suffers with everything what suffers, and so on. But as soon as the church fathers, you know, make that subject into an object of worship, that's when everything went wrong. You know. So, and that is, of course, the, the claim of, of Judaism and, and Islam, you know, that uh, if uh, they, they uh, honor Jesus and they honor Jesus' mother, and so on, they have no problem with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and so on. Um, gee, the orthodoxy still says the mother of the Messiah or whatever but the Romans then say you know the mother of God you see the little formulas like this and people struggled about that and killed each other over it and so on the, um, the, you know to come just the Holy Spirit now the singular does it come only from the universal or does it come from the universal and the particular and so on you see how they um, and, and so the western formula is for both and the eastern formula is only for one the serves you see the how they yeah, God. right yeah right okay both so but I mean these are all struggles you know which are really only possible when the dialectical notion is at work you know it is not the simple guy who reads you know the Our Father or whatever <laughs> but it becomes a thought process you know, what this relationship may really be. And then the political power coming in and say, you have to stop with these struggles and so on, you know, just make up your mind now. Like uh, when you see it at the end, you know, where, where Charles V, when the empire, the Roman German Empire collapses, where it is in Valladolid, where he has withdrawn in a monastery to die, <laughs> and he says, I should have killed him, I should have killed him, Luther, you know. He destroyed my church and he destroyed my empire. It's the church and the empire, you see. The church holds the empire together. The Constantinian type of thing. And so it is then, therefore, one father, you know, and the universal particularizes itself and comes back to, again to the universal. Oneness, oneness, you know. One God, one emperor, one uh, empire. And that all is, kind of right, thank you. That is when it, yeah, right. And that the third Reich, you know, the third empire, uh, repeated this, you know, one God, do we all have this on our belt there, God with us, you know. Oh, so in the Catholic Youth Movement? No, no, in the army, in the SS, oh, everywhere, oh. yeah, right. So one God, one leader, one nation, you know, so uh, it is this oneness, you know, which then gets nationalistic things and, and whatever, you know. The empire was not a nationalistic, it was a combi combination of nations who were not, na na nationalism is modern, you know. After the empire broke together, then the nationalisms came up. You know. So um, uh, this, and, and so you know, the connection between Charlemagne, for instance, kills four thousand Saxons, you know, because they don't want to convert. You know, they had to do it all by hand, you know, in, in order to uh, make the whole thing Christian, to make it one. You know, oneness is strength, and so on. If you have plurality, and so on, you weaken the whole thing. So. So, you know, with us, with this, I mean, we are not even clear about the experiment we have here with the state, which is not legitimated religiously, you know, which has no supernatural or metaphysical legitimation whatsoever, which is a contract, you know, and um, a contract always rests in the arbitrariness of the citizens. Like international laws, you know, rest in the sovereignty of the, of the, in the, in the nation states. And, and if these nation states suddenly see that a certain contract is uh, or, 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 or law or whatever, international law is against their interest, then they cancel it, you know. So that is when, when all these political problems appear. So therefore they always stressed, you know, and, and did something unbelievably strange because the same empire which killed Jesus and hundreds of his friends later on suddenly makes peace with that entity in order to get the proletariat on their side and rescue the empire. And it did not work. hundred years later, the Western Empire collapsed. The Eastern one went on for another thousand years. 
Yeah. So, so the the inability or, or prevention of Christianity from what embracing other yeah. cultures. Okay. Is, is yeah. Let me say because of power. Okay. Let me just explain it. So, the, what the Pope does in my book is to take that Genesis thing and to take the first uh, the first chapter of John together, and so. The, and and uh, let's say, you know, God created his own image in Adam, <coughs> and then he created another image of himself in Jesus of Nazareth, in his son and so on. Now, this is in contradiction with the second commandment, you know, not to make images of God, but they turn it around in a Feuerbach way, you know. It's not we who make an image of God, it's God who made an image of himself in Adam and made then a new image of himself in Jesus the Christ, the new Adam. And so, the, uh, what this concept now, this notion develops is that God is fundamentally a rational being. And that man, who is his image made by God, is also therefore rational. That means it is an emphasis on reason versus uh, will and feeling and, and so on. So, uh, and that goes through the whole Western tradition. No, that, that is really the Hellenization of the whole thing. Nowhere does it say in the Torah that God is reason or whatever. So the, uh, but it is then Platonism and Aristotelianism. Um, and so since God is reason, that means God can speak and has spoken. Man can speak. And because man can speak and have discourse, therefore he doesn't have to kill it. They don't, people don't have to kill each other. That was the message which, which the Pope wanted to give with us. He's a little bit super intellectual. And so, therefore, what he wanted to say is, look, before we were de-Hellenized by the bourgeois enlightenment and by the Reformation and so on, we thought that God was reason and we thought that man was his image and was therefore reason. That means he was a talker. Because logos in word is the same thing. Logos means reason and it means speak. And therefore, we had discourses. And when we have discourses, we can, don't have to have war. We don't have to kill each other. And so uh, then, now, Habermas would, of course, as non-believer, take the side, not, you know, to attack the Pope, what he would say, Pope, you have to remember that this dehellenization produced the Human Rights Declaration of the Bourgeois Revolution and so on, that it produced the uh, Natural Science Revolution and so on. So these were great accomplishments, you know. So if we would re hellenize again, we would risk the loss of these wonderful modern accomplishments, you know. So that is the counter-argument, a believer and a non-believer talking with each other about hellenization. And so, if you take Hellenization away, then you have uh, then the nominalism, you know. You have Gabriel Beale, who is the teacher of Luther, and that is how, how the Reformation got that way, you know. And then, oh, Wilhelm of Ockham, the will of God comes into the foreground. God can say on one side, don't kill, next day he can say, you know, put you these canonites, and, and so on. So, that means God himself becomes will, and then also man becomes will. And you have the whole 19th century that shift to Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and so on, where it is not the intellect now, which the animal rationale, the speaking animal, and so on, but the, where it is will, uh, the will to power, you know, and, and this, uh, where we have this movie there by Riefenstahl, you know, in, in about, what is it called? The, Triumph of the Will. Hmm? Triumph of the Will. Triumph of the Will, yeah, there you have it, you know. Um, and Hitler, even, you know, he have it in a personalized way, you know, the, the, the willpower of this guy. They had a movie on, oh, on the Dr. Sorel, or whatever his name is, who was his medical doctor and fed him with pills and so on. But I mean, what this guy went through, you know, but this iron will, you know, of the Aten offensive, you know, where he was tempted to kill himself uh, already and then holding through once more, another three months, you know, and uh, after the assassination attempt and so on. So this, he lived that, you know. That means the, the body is simply an expression of that will. And therefore, Schopenhauer, of course, has that very strongly. And Schopenhauer was Hitler's philosopher and Gerhard Gerhard's philosopher. And they discussed it to the end of, of their life. So, uh, and therefore, also the fascination, you know, he could underwander the rationality of the intellectuals and the humanists in Germany and so on, and could uh, address that will. Uh, by his speeches, by his rhetoric, you know, with drugs or without drugs doesn't really matter, but the, uh, uh, you know, he was able to uh, 
be in touch with that will to life in millions of people and uh, by his rhetoric and he had a wonderful use of the German language I mean almost like Luther you know uh, was able to you know to seduce them or whatever but it has something to do with the shift from from the intellectual to to will okay. power okay. Yeah. the dehellenization of Christianity yeah, right. was changing it right. from right. Uh, this perfectly rational right. reasonable right. Yeah. God is reason to right. now God is the man is reason is, yeah. um, so now yeah. God is the, the will the, yeah. this and, yeah. irrational will right. so yeah. he's right. bemoaning so uh, Benedict was bemoaning the right the yeah change. Right. bemoaning and quoting the dehellenization process yeah right. what was it Basil Basil he was quoting who was he quoting uh, yeah. when he went Theodosius um yeah. Yeah, but that was, uh, one doesn't really know how that gets into it, you know. He is not a specialist for Islam, you know, so, but he had a professor from Münster, Münster mm -hmm. who is one, and he must have given him that story. Mm -hmm. um, and it happened somewhere in Turkey, and, and uh, you know, that, that Mohammed, with Mohammed just came all this uh, violence, yes. and, and so on and so on, and that was taken very badly. And, and I don't think he meant it, and I'm not entirely sure what that should mean. You know, it cannot mean that Mohammed was dehellenized or whatever, I mean, uh, you know, because that thinks the Aristotelian movement, you know, came along after, after Mohammed, you know, the North African coast and in Spain and so on and so on. And, and at that time, the Muslims were also, were also Hellenized still, you know. Uh, so, and, and he would call back Muslims and Christians and Jews, you know, because the Jews were also Hellenized. The Septuaginta, you know, is a, is a Greek translation of the Torah long before Christianity. So, um, in Egypt and Alexandria. So, all three were Hellenized. And that means all three... Uh, can, could operate with that notion. And when Maimonides, you know, um, says that Christianity is really monotheism, he could only say that because he was himself a great scholastic and know, knew the dialectical notion and knew that the universal is decisive. So, the, for instance, uh, Eckhart would go behind the differentiation of the God where God is absolute purity, where he's not yet differentiated, see. And that is in all three of them, you know. Uh, so that uh, in, in Christianity, then you have people who believe in the Trinity, but say, you know, before there was a Father and a Son and a Spirit, between the universal particular and singular, there was the pure universality, and the soul has to get in contact with them. You have to be one with this oneness of God, and then you are really redeemed, and, and so on. So, so this, um, in all three of these religions, you know, the... Uh, the intellectuals in them, the teachers, you know, were Hellenized. But what to do about this now, you know, that is, that's another question. Obviously, you know, a re-Hellenization is not possible, you know. So, I don't even know if the Pope thinks that this could really be done, you know. He is just critical of, of these three things, of the Reformation and of the bourgeois Enlightenment and of the present multiculturalism and what it would do, what it does to these religions, namely uh, it becomes more a will type of a thing and we will not have discourse with each other and we have to slaughter each other because where there is no discourse there is war. If you want to have war, all what you have to do is to repress discourse. That's what Bush did. Should we take a break? Yeah. It's almost eight. Yeah, okay. okay. And we want to have our movie too, right, today. Yeah. Let's not forget it. Yeah, we are for 8.50, right? Yep. Yeah.